OK, the transcription has started. So what I'm doing is I'm showing a um, a page of an online database of international wildlife um, illegal animal trade incidents. OK, so if we look at one of these, um, we can uh, sort them by date. And uh, if we look, one was added um, just a few days ago, the 25th of April. And uh, if we click on the ID number of it, we can go through and get quite a bit of information. We can see that um, its report, it's got a unique report ID. Um, now 49,000, we'll address that in a second. Maybe there are around 49,000 events in this database. It was a seizure. It happened in Vietnam. Uh, it consisted of four rhino horns, 37 pieces of ivory, uh, and it says a little details of uh, where the seizure took place. Method of transport. Um, the, this is based on an aggregation of uh, maybe volunteers or maybe some automation of um, scanning news outlets for these kinds of stories. And for some of them, there are outcomes as well. Um, so if we just go back and I scroll out, now you won't be able to see much of the detail when I do this, but um, we can get the number of um, events on each page here up to 100 rows of data. Uh, and we can search by species, by country, and the default data that is open access just by asking permission is uh, is here now there is a there's an export button up here and if you select some buttons selecting all the records um now since i decided to do this uh, i think let me say it this way before i decided to run a, a herrig meeting showing some techniques for cleaning scraped web scraped data um, I, I had asked for permission to just download this data in a, in a flat file, in a rectangular data file, and I never had an answer. And so uh, I started thinking about, well, this, this student needs to do the project, needs access to the data. We do have access to it. Um, and I thought of ways that I could... Um, could have the student transcribe the data, and it turned out there were about um, there were a, a quite a lot of um, of uh, of records, five thousand or something of um, the pangolin alone. And also in our discussions, we decided that the context of other kinds of wildlife trade was part of the question that we would like. So it would have to be the pangolin plus others. And like on this pie chart, it's incidents by species. It says species, but it also says parenthetically that it's a uh, um, different taxonomic levels and it, the default sort is by order. And, you know, if I mouse over the, the blue piece of pie on the pie chart, you might see the pop up that's over here. If you can see my cursor is um, proboscidea, which are elephants and uh, the kin of elephants. So t tusk ivory primarily. And if we go to another one, the green is uh, carnivora. Um, so carnivores and, and it's all sorts of animals, but um, many of the those represented by carnivores are tigers that are used in Chinese medicine. Um, and if I um, go over this purple slice, it's uh, folidota, which are the uh, the pangolin. So they're they're quite a big percentage here. So for various reasons, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't think of this when we started the project, but um, I'm just going to say it quickly and then go to the code, um, is that uh, we decided that since we could ask for 100 records per page and that the all of the records for the, the four or five largest mammalian categories were, um, in my judgment, were downloadable a hundred at a time manually. So I, I charged the student initially with the task of uh, copying and pasting pages of 100 records into a text document. 
I'll show you what those look like in a second. But that's the background for this. And uh, most of on the on the first part of today, most of what I'm going to show you is going to be um, how these records look when we manually process them like that. And I'm going to show you the complete workflow I used to convert it into a tidy data frame. Then right at the end, um, I'm going to show you a uh, just a snippet of code that more recently um, someone came to my office uh, and we had a meeting and after the meeting was over, they said, oh, by the way, I'm interested in downloading some data from the web and web scrape it. And uh, in, a, in a little bit of conversation, I uh, tried to understand their problem. It's a very similar problem to this one um, that I showed. And I, I there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of tools out there for automation of web, web scraping. And so over my sandwich, um, one day in, a, in 30 spare minutes I had, I came up with a solution that would at least in part automate um, grabbing data. And I'll show you how I solved that uh, to inspire you. If people are interested in a more advanced session after today, I would love to do it because it's super fun grabbing data off the web. Now, first off, if, uh, if you come to the schedule page, if you want to follow along, you can download the manual scrape project files. This is a zipped folder and you can follow along with me if you wish. I'm going to explain every step. Uh, so you can download this and unzip it to a location on your computer and that will be your working directory inside that folder. And for the auto scrape example, it's just an R script. So let me just test. Oh, great, they're not working. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll just drop them in the uh, chat. I'm, I don't know why they're not working, but I'm not going to pause to uh, figure that out. So what I'll do instead is I'll um, drop the zip file into the into the chat right now. It's not very big. It's a couple of um, megabytes, including all the data and everything. And then I'm going to drop in the um, Ecotox folder. <clears throat> What is it supposed to treat? Um, I haven't the, the foggiest idea about it. You can Google up the purported uses of uh, pangolin scales, but they use a lot of pieces of the pangolin for different ailments. The, uh, the scales may treat arthritis, the claws might treat impotence, you know, the, um, the hide might treat, uh, you know, scabies. I, I don't know what they use them to treat. They do, I know, purport different parts to have different significance. So it they folded this modern practice into the traditional mumbo jumbo of this kind of um, this kind of stuff. So I'm I'm not an expert in that. It is interesting, but I, I haven't read about it. I'm a skeptic, as you can tell. Can somebody just confirm that those folders have uh, come through? Have the files come through? Going to get a one in the chat if uh, if you can see the yes. files. Yes. OK, thank you. All right, so if you um, if you unzip the zip file. You'll see a uh, folder that looks like this poaching. So that's that's in the zip file. It's just the poaching folder, and if you open the poaching folder. You're going to see all the stuff here. That is the um, the result of my um, my um, my project, and I'm just gonna. If you haven't used projects yet, we haven't talked a lot about them for some reason in here. But it, if there's more than certainly, if there's more than um, two scripts, or if there's more than one data frame, I will these days I will just instantly start a project. I'm not going to talk about how to start a project, but I will just say that to open this, you um, just need to open, double click the project folder. And uh, before I drag over R, I'll just point out that <clears throat> my default way of um, setting up this kind of uh, this kind of um, project is that I'll have the project file in a root directory. This 
in this case, the um, working directory, the root directory is called poaching. The project file lives in there. And I usually make the folder first that I want to be the um, working directory, and then I'll, I'll make it a, an R project. I have a master script that lives in the root directory, the working directory. And then notice I have another script that's a folder called scripts. And in that, um, in this case, there's significant data handling. We're going to spend most of our time looking at the data script today. And then in the data folder, uh, in this case, there are 16 data files. Each one of them um, has about a thousand lines of data. So this this are, and that's tidy lines of data, a uh, thousand tidy lines. So when it says um, artiodactyla one to 10, we just open this real quick. Um, we see that this has got really, really untidy data in text format. And uh, the student, um, I think it would be fair to say, and I'm not trying to denigrate the student, but uh, they they lacked basic computer skills, and um, the the plan was to drop this, paste this into a um, into a plain test text uh, file, and that they just couldn't do it. So they um, used uh, this RTF format, which is um, a, a formatted text based on a form of mark markdown, an old fashioned one, but uh, we were able to fix it anyway. So this is opened up in Word by default in Windows. If I just open this in um, text, uh, open with Notepad, it looks very similar to the um, plain RTF folder. Now, if I look back here at the data that were scraped, most of these jobs have an ID, a date, category, subject that's got some text, the country of incident. Um, this is a country where the incident occurred. And then another one that says uh, the countries involved. Sometimes there's just one country that's named and sometimes it says two countries and you have to dig deeper into the database to get the other um, data. And species gives the order by default. There are other levels that you can get. <clears throat> and if there are more than one species, you only get two species. So uh, in the first pass, we um, we see that we get the ID. Now, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger for you. There we go. We see that we get the um, ID number. And then a um, so this is the ID of that case. And then we get a forward slash. <clears throat> and then we get um, a date and then a backslash. And we get another line with the incident type. We get another line with the comments, another line with the first country, and another line with the species. Now on this one, we have uh, two fields on the first row, one field on the you know, the third field on the second row, fourth field on the third row, fifth field on uh, the um, fourth row. There's another row, there's another field rather, the second country. Remember, the second country is, is missing in many of the records. And uh, in this copy, we're we're missing that line, and then in the um, in the in this case the the fifth row is the uh, seventh field, <laughs> okay. And sometimes, like in this one, um, we will get uh, also we only get um, one country. Let's find one that's got two countries. I can just find one quickly. I'll I'll do it. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. <clears throat> yeah, I don't I don't see one coming out, but in a moment we'll look at um, some data that will uh, allow us to explore that. So I'm just going to close this. 
going to go back to my folder. I'm going to go back to my project, which I have already opened. And I'm going to drag my um, R script into place. Now, uh, when you first open a, um, a file, you may have the R history folder in there, my R history folder. So you'll see some noodling that I did if that has stayed living in there. But um, the first one that we want to open up here is the um, the analysis file. Now this goes through part of the analysis that the student did for their project. This is an HRP, an undergraduate bachelor's um, database project. <clears throat> But one of the things that I do is uh, some of you have seen me um, do this before quite a bit. Is that um, I have sourced uh, a file that's in the scripts folder called data.r. And um, if we just go over to the data folder down here in the in the um, navigation pane, oops, that's the data folder, the scripts folder. We can just open the data folder. I'm going to go uh, spend a little time going through the the data file this, I don't intend under normal use for reproducible research that you don't even need to open this. We just call it. It does the work. And uh, this is where most of the coding did. The student couldn't be involved in this. I mean, it's it's not very much code. It's um, about 100 lines of code, but uh, what it does is it takes um, the data in all of these folders, you know, two files there, five files there, and so forth. There are 16 files like this. Each one of them have about a thousand tidy rows. So each one of them has four, or five, or six thousand um, text based rows. And, and they either have five rows or six rows, depending on the data. So it's a bit of a mess. And there are also some characters in there that are a bit weird. So um, the first thing that we do need to do is load a couple of libraries. Stringer has some nice tools for searching in text-based data. I'm just going to load that. I hope I have these installed because I've just updated my R to 4.2.3. And then Lubridate is the um, a very useful folder. I sometimes use the base R date data type functions, but I, more and more lately I've, I've kind of given up uh, in my war against the tidyverse in, in some places, and this is one of the places I've kind of given up. So I, I do use Lubridate for date format data these days. Okay, so those are loaded, and um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm just going to initialize some variables. I'm just going to check the time here. <clears throat> we have plenty of time to go through this. What this does, this list.files function will list the um, will list the um, the the locations in my data folder. So if I just run that, it, it's just listing the names of the folders in my data folder. Uh, it, it will list files or folder names, and it's equivalent to the ls function, um, the list function, uh, like in Linux. <clears throat> So I'm going to put that into a um, object called folders, three, two, one, and uh, then I'm going to initialize a list style variable for the files. I'm going to make a list of the files, three, two, one. That's right. It does the same thing as dir in the Windows operating system. That's right. And for paths, I'm going to initialize a character, um, and that'll be the paths to each of the data folders, three, two, one. Now, <clears throat> I've um, just made a um, just made a uh, a call with a for loop, and uh, the length of the folders is uh, five. So uh, I've made this very generic. I've gone for i in one to the length of the folders variable. So the folders variable we can see is it's got five, and for each one, I'm going to go into it. And um, in this files um, object that I initialized, I just gave it a name. I'm going to, um, because it's a list, I'm going to use the address structure with the two 
square um, brackets. And so for the uh, first location, the first um, part of the list, I'm going to list the files that are in the first folder, which is Artiodactyla. And uh, I'm using this paste command to paste um, the whole file path for each of those folders for the five um, places. So um, I'm listing the files that are in the location of data, Artiodactyla, plus a forward slash. So if I just set I to one to see what this does um, <clears throat> once, uh, I'm just going to list the files in the first folder. Three, two, one. So in that first folder, this is just the names of those files. That's all this is doing. And it's going to stay save each of those into a location in this list. OK, so I'm just going to run this for loop three, two, one. Let's just look inside the files list. We can look at it down in the console three, two, one. And so it's a list. The first location has both of the file names for the Artiodactyla folder. The second part of the list has the carnivora um, files and so forth. So I'm going to exploit that in the in the next step. And this one, I'm going to create a path um, character string for each of the files that I want to read in. So uh, this one goes uh, one to the length of folders. I can recycle my I because I'm outside. I'm in a new for loop, but I've this one. I've got a nested for loop. So I've got to use in the nest a different variable to cycle through the uh, first. The folder names will be the I dummy variable, and second the um, the um, I'll use J in the inner for loop to cycle through the files list. So for each folder and each of the files in each of the folders, I'm just going to construct the path and the name of that folder. So again, I'm using paste to data, the name of the folder, forward slash, and the name of the file. So it's the, the file folder combination. So um, what variable does our, um, does our, um, I'm just going to run this now and have a look at the paths variable to show you. It'll be clearer then, but you can play with this. Three, two, one. And print out the paths. So you can see I've got the 16 files and I've just um, got a character string of where they live in our working directory. Now this is this is not very generic in the sense that our data, our raw data had a certain structure that is not really transferable to to other projects from this. So um, next, I'm going to make a, a holder for the raw data. Um, I just put that out. Oh yeah, that's our files. So uh, we know our our variables. Let me just pull this in. Um, our variables that we want to read in are those ones that I read to you. Case ID, date, event, comment, country one, country two, species, and the order. So uh, this is just a um, character vector with the names of the um, data fields, three, two, one. Then I'm going to create a, um, a data frame that I'm going to call master data. And I'm just initializing it. Um, based on a matrix. And now I had to do this for some reason. Um, maybe I'll remember why I had to do this. I had to go back and initialize this as a matrix, but uh, that's what I did do in any case. Maybe that's the only way I could figure out to initialize initialize a, a blank data frame. So I'm just going to do that. Master file should uh, pop up up in the um, data part of the, the uh, global environment, 321. So I've got zero observations of the eight variables. They're named generically, and I'm going to um, smash those column names in there by uh, putting um, the names vector into the column names um, attribute of my master data 
data frame. Three, two, one. Watch the names over in the global environment. There we go. Now we've got our names in there. So this is just made a fully initialized uh, receptacle for the data that I'm about to organize. Now, um, my comment to myself is that this is a, a big old for loop to uh, with a call to a function called rbind. And what rbind does is it takes two um, square or rectangular pieces of data and it it does kind of what it, it, it insinuates in the name, it binds them by rows. It's row bind, R bind. So um, one thing that I wanted to do is uh, what I needed to do was have a variable that can count the number of lines in each successive file as a placeholder for, um, for how many lines I need to read in. So I'm just going to initialize that uh, as a numeric, 321. There's nothing in it, so it's just down there waiting for me to put something in it. Lines for a file right here. And uh, so then I've got a big old for loop. I'm going to make this big so we can see it. And um, it's a um, it's uh, quite large. If I go down, so the um, for loop ends on line 75 and it starts on line 30. OK, so I guess by by legendary for loop standards, this is a normal for loop. But by for loop standards that we normally do in R, it's fairly sizable one. Let's call it a medium sized one by R standards. So uh, what I'm going to do is I remember what my path variable is. Let me just print it out again to remind you. It's got the the path to each of the data files I want to read in. So the um, the outer loop is going to go through each of those path files uh, one at a time. It's going to um, set up a temp object with the filthy unordered data, and I'm using the um, read lines function. All this does is it reads every line one at a time of a plain text file, and it stores it as a vector of um, of um, character data. So if there are um, a thousand lines in a file, uh, or in this case there are more like five thousand lines in a file, um, we will we will read five thousand lines and create a, a vector that has five thousand addresses, uh, each of which is the entire contents of one of those lines. Okay, so. Um, if I just dump out the first thousand lines down in the console to see what that looks like, three, two, um, let's see what I is set to. I set the five. It doesn't matter for this little example. Let's just see what that looks like. It's going to be really ugly, three, two, one. <clears throat> we can see it's literally just read in the lines. And also, it's it's done something else is, if you remember looking in to the text file um, per ASCII coding, uh, we, I, we usually think that Notepad lets us see everything in the file, but it has a an escape character at the end, another backslash, uh, probably put in there by the RTF and, and probably made invisible to us uh, by Notepad. So Notepad is not a base level text viewer. It, it also has some software magic going on on top of it. But we can examine it easily um, with the read lines function. So what this for loop does for each one of those paths is it makes a, a list of all the data. Um, this particular one you can see had uh, 5,210 entries. Remember there are either five or six lines. So the, the 5,210 should give you an idea that there are more lines with that missing second country. So we, we kind of know that. I have to contend with that. Second one that I've used here that we have mentioned it in here before. I've done it in a really ugly, very explicit way, and I could make the code shorter for this, but um, but I've made it bigger to try to get the student, make it easier to understand for the student and, and maybe for anybody who hasn't used grep before. But um, if you bring open the um, the help file for grep, it's a set of tools 
that allows you to uh, do pattern matching. Some of the tools do slightly different things, um, and some of them return slightly different things. But the the point of um, of uh, what we're trying to do here is I'm trying to find the the lines that contain a particular pattern, and I put the pattern that I'm looking for in a character stream. Now um, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger <clears throat> in case everybody. Um, so that everybody can see. But um, in this particular case, it's looking for uh, these square brackets um, that uh, have 0 dash 9 in them. They symbolize a space that could take any value of a numeric character um, 0 to 9. And uh, the bracket is a um, notation for a single placeholder that could take any value for the uh, values inside note uh, that are indicated inside the bracket. So here I'm asking for a pattern that has any digit 0 to 9, any digit 0 to 9, so two digits, a forward slash, another any digit for 0 to 9, another zero digit any digit 0 to 9, so another two digits, forward slash, and uh, then four digits. If we just look back at um, one of the dates here, we can see that uh, there's a for the backslash T is a symbol for tab. And there are two tabs embedded in just that first line. But what I'm trying to do with this code is I'm finding the lines in each file that have um, this date field, any date. And what I want to do with that date temp is um, I want to use it to um, to find uh, how many ID rows of data there are, because there every group of those rows will only have the one date. So it's just a little trick that I thought of by examining the raw data. Um, and so, for example, if I read in the data temp. And then I um, uh, look at that. It's it's giving me the um, the rows where that date occurs. You can see in this case that there's nine uh, nine nine five six seven eight nine one thousand. Remember, we're searching one thousand by one thousand, so this is one that landed perfectly on a thousand ID rows. In fact, they all should, but for some reason they didn't all exactly um, do that. And I'm putting that in a variable called my rows. And then um, getting the um, the lines per file. Uh, here I'm, I'm concatenating it with itself. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because I'm iterating each time. I want to get a vector. I want to end up with a vector that's got the number of lines in each file for the 16 files. And then finally, I'm um, I'm asking this question about the rows that have six or seven fields. Um, and I'm um, I'm um, asking this question about the the row length. OK. Uh, I'm not going to go through this because I'm worried that we're going to run out of time. <laughs> but uh, trust me, that's what I'm doing here. You can play around with it um, for yourself. And um, so then uh, I I take a data frame of my matrix and I um, I make a new folder. Remember I've made or a new data frame. Remember I've made a placeholder data frame called master data. And uh, here I'm creating an intermediate data frame that's just called my data. It's based um, on um, uh, to initialize a place for the intermediate data for just one of the data files. So it's exactly the same code as above um, to initialize it. It's exactly the same names and exactly the same uh, column names step as we did above. This is just for the intermediate data as distinct from the, the whole data at the end within the for loop. So then um, the way that I chose to deal with five rows versus six rows of untidy data 
is I, I've just um, made a sub for loop. It's going to loop, loop through <clears throat> all the rows. And uh, what I've done here is I've created one kind of um, if statement for uh, the case where the data are contained in five rows where there's only one country. And I've created an if statement where there's um, where they're both countries. So there are six rows for the seven data fields. And what's going on here is I'm using a couple of different tools um, here. Now for the for the five rows, what I want to end up with is seven variables. Also for the six rows, I want to end up with seven variables. So there are seven reads for each of these, uh, whether it's five or six. So to read in the case ID, I uh, string split the, the rows um, that uh, start at zero from the last row that had the date variable in it. So it's the very first part of where the date variable was on that first line. And uh, I've, I've recall made that into a, um, to a, um, a variable that I can exploit the my rows variable to just cycle through every row that starts with a date. So that's the way I've structured this scrape. And uh, the string split will split um, that first row based on this command into um, two parts. One is the ID and uh, it creates a list. So I use the list notation on the string split um, function. And I want the first one for the case ID and I want the second value for the date. I've used string split for both of them. Um, now this is not very efficient, but this is a fairly small. So it's, it's only something like um, I don't know, fifty thousand lines of character text. So uh, it's it's fairly small by by any real muscle standards for big data. To grab the event, um, I've used G sub to get the and separate the parts I do want from the parts I don't want. Here it's the the part, the row with the date plus one. The next one, the comment is the row with the date plus two and so forth. And I've used G sub to just separate out the um, parts that I do want from the parts that I don't want. When I get down to country for this one, I know country is missing if the row length is five for um, for the or until the next date happens. So I put a missing variable in there. And uh, finally, I um, have put um, a, a G sub call to grab the, the species. Now the species um, is, remember it is, um, it's a column that's got variable number of things and I've just popped in another variable called order that I'll populate a little bit down below. Okay, so th these that's what that does. And then at the end of it, <clears throat> I, um, I R bind um, my initialized master data with the intermediate my data. And then down here at the end, I, um, I put into the master data all at once. I put in um, into the order variable and I, I populate it um, according to the number of files so that it's available. So I just count the number of lines, tidy lines per file. It's a bit of an awkward way to do it, but it was the fastest solution I came to and I kept it just to tell you about it. And then the last one that I go through down here, this set of code um, is to, um, I made a few intermediate variables for us to analyze uh, with the student. Um, I've made a, a date where I've <clears throat> used Luberdate. I've made a year for, for year. I've um, in one of the variables I've done post 2017 uh, based on a Boolean. I've created a decade variable because we wanted to look at differences across the decades and I've just picked somewhat arbitrarily, but also informed by major legislation 
in international trade. Um, these these four breaks for the decades, four decades that the data spans. It spans, um, you know, um, I think it spans from the mid '80s up to the present day. You know, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think these tables were just for us to examine the data, and um, then I made another variable for continent uh, because we had some predictions about continent. And uh, then finally, I've just removed the stuff I don't need from that. So I've got some stuff over here, which I'm going to delete. Yes, I'm going to go back. Now I'm a little bit worried. What have I? What have I changed? I don't know if I want to save anything. Can't remember what I changed in there now. But uh, what I'm going to do is just call the source script. Um, three, two, one. Let's just bring up the console just in case anything interesting is going to happen down there. Hopefully it doesn't. Three, two, one. <clears throat> so I do get a um, a little bit of a warning. And uh, but if I look in there, I see that I've got about um, 15,700 variables. Remember, I ex expected I had 16 files and I expected around 1,000 um, per file. So I expected around 16,000. I got 15,707. And then I, I have one in here. I think I've given you the output data of what the master data looks like without row names. That just makes sure there's no number written to write CSV. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, go on. I yes. have a question. Uh, where is this warning from? Is it from the read lines function, do you think? I would have to look because uh, I, I thought that I had made the code in the data file so that it wouldn't read it, print out any warnings. Uh -huh. um, I think it's probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll find it by myself then. Yeah, yeah, you can play with it. Um, yeah, that'd, be nice, that'd be nice to drop in the in the slack if you do find out where it is. I There were yeah. some warnings when I did this and some of the code you'll notice I've put in suppress warnings and um, low verbosity arguments yeah, yeah. in some of the uh -huh. folders. But I, I did double check. I did a, quite a lot of due diligence on setting up that. That um, the data script that I showed you, so I'm happy that it works. I'm going to really quickly show you the analysis because that's not the point and then just have one minute to uh, show you the other um, script that I want want to show you because it does something completely different to this one. Um, what I did was I created a, an aggregation of <clears throat> um, some of the events per year uh, and how it changes through time. Made a box plot of events uh, according to those um, done. Oh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'll have to play with that in my spare time. <laughs> I love Notepad++. I've just installed it afresh uh, on my home computer. But yeah, no plus, Notepad++ plus plus is um, it's classic. You've just revealed your hand as a as a really old hacker, Matt, by using Notepad++. Plus plus. Um, I have a strip chart that overlays the uh, data. What we can basically see is that there are um, there's an increase in the intensity events, and, and 2017 was a year that um, that uh, a major event of legislation for Pangolin was introduced. But overall, the number of uh, events for uh, for um, for uh, each year has has increased <clears throat> despite that legislation. Um, Got a histogram of um, our residuals to look at a predictive test. Um, that's off of the um, to do a t test, and it it's not really uh, it doesn't adhere. It's bimodal, so we didn't trust that. So we're going to do a, a Wilcox test, and uh, it is a significant difference. So that's not surprising, based on uh, what we can see here. Another test was the proportional change post 2017 for the orders, made a table of the orders. Um, it looks like that. Um, I've made a vector of colors. You can see the colors. This is my favorite recent um, aesthetic, but also very functional way of doing it. There's two shades of each of these colors. You'll see what it looks like in a second. 
uh, made another vector of colors. Make a bar plot. This is a um, if I just add the. Um, the text with a legend, there we go. The resolution is not exactly the same as the computer we made this on, but what you can see is that um, there are um, there are more incidences. It looks like for some orders. Let me try to make it where we can see the order. So more for carnivora um, pre 2017, but um, you know the trend is an increase for some after 2017, and then we just did a chi square on that. And um, yeah, we've got probably an excess of power to, uh, to because the sample size is quite large. So even though these differences are not huge, overall the, the pattern is not the same across the years for all of the taxa. And that's not surprising because some go in one direction, some go in the other. Did a postdoc comparison of each of them, Artiodactyla to, uh, and it's just, this is comparing um, pangolins to all the others. I'm not going to go through the rest, but you get the idea. Basically, the um, this part was just strong arming, figuring out and deciphering the copy and paste strong arm data capture. Now, since we did this, um, I made a second request to have that data, and they came back um, and said that, yes, we grant you access to the database, and you can download 1,000 records per month. Remember, there are, there are something like 49,000 records in the whole database. We got 16,000, but we only took about a third of the total taxa, and there are plants and other things. So they, they basically said, no, we won't let you have just download it for, without work. So we could go back and download this manually, but the work that I did to turn this into tidy data was not wasted. All right, so um, just quickly in the last couple of minutes, and I do have to leave on time today, so I have to leave. I'm going to go through this extremely quickly. Is um, This was um, Joe Roberts and Ben came by. And they had this uh, site. I'm just going to copy it and go to it. I really only have a couple of minutes to spend to show you this. I'm just going to go to this. They were interested in pesticide effect based on a few fields of this. And there are many, many pages in this database. We'll just, uh, you already have the, um, the URL, but you can click along, come along if you want. And um, if you scroll down here, there's loads and loads of data, all sorts of things uh, in here. And they were interested, they said, in this particular field, the ecotoxicology field for the terrestrial ecotoxicology and for the aquatic toxicology. And they wanted to grab the data off here. Now, I just showed you a method to do it that the student clicked through like uh, 10 of those 100 record pages to get 1,000 records, and they did that 16 times. So they had to copy and paste 160 pages. But I, I think on this database, there are quite a lot more records. And not only that, the organization of this um, web page is much more janky. Like, for example, this um, row, the other bee species, has got um, divided. Um, column here. And so the formatting is like one off. And if, if you go up here, if you're using Chrome, I recommend you do use Chrome. Um, even if you prefer another browser day to day, Chrome has got its um, uses. And if you go, um, if you go over to, let's see here, history downloads bookmark, more tools. And you go down to developer tools, control shift I, I must remember that. And we hit developers tools. What we can do is we can look inside the HTML. And if you mouse over sections of the, um, the contents of an HTML page, like the general information, we can find um, regions of the, um, of the um, web page that have uh, 
that uh, this code designates. So you can see that I'm I'm mousing over this bit of the code and we're highlighting over the div inner dot inner tube over to the left. So through this manually seeing how the structure of the HTML was set up, um, I was able to do that on this page because it's quite an old fashioned web page by modern standards. Um, a lot of modern pages have a lot of JavaScript embedded that can pull in content from a database. F12 will do it too, you're quite right. Um, but to cut to the chase, uh, what I did for this one, was if I just get rid of everything. I uh, used um, some tools in a couple of web um, web based packages to uh, designate a URL. Now for every one of the pages you wanted, you would have to designate the URL. And um, then I have done this fairly manually in this code, but I've um, you'd also have to designate which field you wanted to grab the data from. So I've pulled out the field terrestrial um, ecotoxicology. And I, I've also furthermore had to play with the structure of the tables. So uh, to find the ancestor table, some jargon, HTML jargon, if you would like to, to discover more about that. And then the following dash sibling table um, that contains that phrase and I've done that for both of those. And so I'm just going to quickly go through this. This code. I grab the URL, the page we were just on. Um, get the response from uh, the get command. In HTTR. And uh, grab um, the contents of the page. Now getting an error which is not very good, and maybe because. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to solve this because I have to leave right now. Unfortunately, I have to leave you on the edge of your seat, folks. I think this is probably because I have. Um, I it just is possible because they've updated the web page since I ran this code, or it's possible that uh, I've updated something because I'm running it now on a different computer than the one I wrote it on. So I have to leave it there have to go get my child before child services comes to take us all away. I'll see you later. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye. bye.